a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is neither imminent nor inevitable. And I think that is a very important message. I'm Steve Orlands, president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm thrilled to host today's event. When some of America's greatest experts get together to write a book, the reader gets a real treat. The recently published U.S.-Taiwan Relations, Will China's Challenge Lead to a Crisis, is one of the great books on this subject. It should be required reading for all members of Congress, members of the executive branch and the public that have interest or work on this subject. Today, we're only missing one of the authors, which is Ryan Haas, and we're thrilled to have the other two author authors with us, Bonnie Glazer now running the Indo-Pacific program at the German Marshall Fund and Richard Bush who is now a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. So let me start with a question with Bonnie. This is, as I've said, a terrific, terrific book. It, it should be required reading. But tell me why this book, why now? And you've got three authors. How did you divide the writing? Well, thank you so much, Steve, uh, for reading the book uh, and for having uh, Richard and me to talk about it. Uh, in March of 2020, you may recall that uh, the then commander of Indo-Pacific Command, Phil Davidson, uh, gave testimony before Congress, and he talked about uh, China's threat to Taiwan and, and said that uh, there could be a Chinese invasion of Taiwan by 2027. And it had an enormous impact, I think, on, uh, on the executive branch, on, on the, the military writ large, and on the American public. And we felt that uh, after that speech, this really became a very defense-driven conversation. People began to say, war in the Taiwan Strait is inevitable. Uh, we must stop it. Uh, and the, Richard and, 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 uh, and Ryan and I felt that people really needed to understand many aspects of this issue uh, at China's policies toward Taiwan, um, uh, Taiwan's own handling of the situation and the history of, uh, of this issue. And we believe that uh, war, of course, has been prevented uh, since 1979 when we normalized relations with China and that this could continue. So we felt there was a lot of misunderstanding. We decided to write a short article and we sent it to the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. Nobody would publish it. <laughs> I think everybody just wanted to hear that the war is coming. Uh, eventually, we did publish that piece in, in NPR.com. Um, we were very grateful that they published it. And then we decided, you know, we really should write a, a longer book. And we have to give credit to Ryan because it was Ryan's idea. And uh, so we divvied it up and uh, uh, Ryan uh, wrote uh, the brief introduction. Uh, Richard wrote the really terrific summary of the history of U.S.-Taiwan relations and how we've dealt, of course, with the issue of the cross-strait relations in the U.S.-Taiwan relationship. And then I wrote the period about uh, the uh, Trump and Biden administrations, which covers the two terms of uh, President Tsai Ing-wen in Taiwan. And then Ryan wrote the uh, conclusion Conclusion, which looks at scenarios that could that could happen in the future and uh, sets out some policy recommendations. And of course, we all reviewed and commented on and improved each other's sections. Well, it, it's terrific. I mean, and, and the division into three parts, I think, is is very is very interesting. But let's first talk about the history. You know, the the pre two thousand and sixteen part, which I guess Richard, you wrote. One thing that's always interested me is in, you know, if in 19, so in 1971, ROC was expelled, PRC joined the UN. If we had thought about it earlier, was a two-state solution possible in the period prior to 1971? Uh, thanks for your uh, kind words, Steve. Um, and thanks for doing this podcast. Um, actually, um, in the early 1960s, U.S. diplomats who saw 
that Beijing was increasing its members, its supporters in the UN, and that sooner or later the ROC would be kicked out, uh, worked on international solutions uh, that in a way that would keep the ROC in. And in effect, they um, uh, came up with a two-state solution. Uh, and the idea was that there were two successor states from the ROC that uh, founded the UN in, um, um, in 1945. Um, we floated this with Taiwan. Uh, the answer that we got back was no, hell no. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek at that time uh, took a very zero-sum approach to this relationship. He had a phrase, uh, civilized people and bandits can't coexist in the same space. And of course, the communists were the bandits, the gongfei. Yep. Um, if he had accepted that approach, I think the effect would have been to um, keep the PRC out of the UN. And um, I think cynically that that was what the United States would would have been happy to see. Because mm -hmm. the PRC would have rejected it, in your view. Yes, and and once the PRC so got in, buy. yeah, once yeah. the PRC got in, um, it um, uh, it didn't want to compromise with Taiwan because it uh, yeah, saw sure. that time was on its side. Yeah, because my question was, was it a a day a day late and a dollar short? Is the, the expression um, I yes. always use. You know, could it have happened before seventy one? You you divide the book from two thousand and sixteen. Why not from two thousand and thirteen, when Xi Jinping took office? Um, I think it the answer has to do with um, changes in Taiwan and the impact um, on Xi Jinping's uh, policies. Um, from 2008, uh, Taiwan's president was Ma Ying-jeou. He believed that engagement with China uh, was the best way uh, to preserve uh, Taiwan's uh, freedom, its prosperity, and to preserve peace. Um, and for about um, six years, that worked. He got reelected by a, a clear margin. Uh, and then um, trouble started. Uh, some elements in Taiwan um, uh, objected uh, to more and more to his policies, uh, and they thought that engaging China was uh, actually putting Taiwan on a slippery slope towards PRC-designed unification. Um, and so um, that led to the election of Tsai Ing-wen in uh, 2016. And I expect that this raised questions in Beijing, such as what happened? We thought that uh, uh, the Taiwan public supported Ma's policies. Um, we thought that if we cooperated with him, uh, we could um, keep the KMT in power. And now the party that we hate, the Democratic Progressive Party, is back in power. What happened? Does implicit in the division in 2016 is the theory that it's changes in Taiwan that have really led to what is going on today, as opposed to the ascension of the current leader of China. Is that a fair conclusion? Either I think so. I, I, I think Xi Jinping um, was uh, fundamentally continuing the policies that uh, uh, had been laid down, um, you know, even 30 years before. And um, he elaborated them as he went. Uh, but it was this setback because of political changes in Taiwan that caused uh, a rethink of uh, how to go about achieving the unification objective. You agree with that, Bonnie? Well, I do, but I think we really can't ignore um, the PRC's policies either. Uh, Xi Jinping did inherit from Hu Jintao the policy of pursuing peaceful development across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, but as 
uh, I think that in, in uh, we saw certainly in 2017, he said that reunification is a requirement for national rejuvenation. Now, yes, that may have been in part a response to the fact that sentiments had changed in Taiwan and policy had changed. But I think also Xi Jinping himself wanted to put this issue of the importance of unification front and center. So I, I would say that it is an interactive process. How many speeches, the book talks about this, but I'm just asking this for the audience. How many speeches have has, has Xi Jinping really given on Taiwan? No, that's really an excellent question, Steve. Xi Jinping has talked about Taiwan in important speeches, such as at the 19th Party Congress in 2017 and the 20th Party Congress in 2022. But he has only given one comprehensive speech on policy toward uh, Taiwan, and that was January 2nd, uh, 2019. And it was the 40th anniversary of what they call the message to compatriots. And I think he was compelled to give a comprehensive speech at that juncture. Uh, and it came at a time when there was, of course, the uh, presidential uh, campaign uh, was underway uh, in, in Taiwan and had an enormous impact on the election. And Tsai Ing-wen's poll ratings had been very low. And because of what was going on with the repression in Hong Kong combined with Xi Jinping's speech, I think that really boosted support for her then. Uh, but that speech was very important. Mm -hmm. You think the U.S. has correctly interpreted that speech or have they focused on kind of the reunification as opposed to the peaceful development? Well, I, I think that uh, it, in general terms, not just that speech, um, there has been a lot of concern about the development of Chinese capabilities. So when, when we look at threats, we have to look at intent and intent we can interpret um, uh, in part from uh, rhetoric and speeches. And Xi Jinping talks about peaceful reunification, although he has not ruled out the threat of uh, force, of course. Uh, uh, but at the same time, the other component is capabilities. And the US has rightly focused on the development of PLA capabilities, which really started in earnest in the late 1990s. But what we have seen in the last decade is the development of capabilities by China to impose um, very large costs on a potentially intervening US force in the event that China uh, were to attack Taiwan. And so we call these you know, anti-access area denial uh, capabilities. So China has conventional advantages in many areas and of course geographical uh, advantages being so close to Taiwan. And so there's been a lot of focus on the capability side of this. That's really, I think, motivated the response uh, of the United States. But it's important to note that the, the intent should not be dismissed. And many people say intent can change overnight, capabilities cannot, and that's a fair statement. But Xi Jinping has not said that it, he has said that he will use force, that he has abandoned peaceful means, um, and that reunification must take place by 2027. That is not true. Uh, and so after there was a lot of confusing statements coming out of uh, particularly the Pentagon, I am glad to see that in the last maybe six months, uh, we have now heard a, a very clear message from the Department of Defense that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is neither imminent nor inevitable. And I think that is a very important message. One last question on history, then let's come to closer to the present. Um, you said the buildup started in the 90s. Was that a result of the Li Donghui visit to the United States? Was that a kind of a tipping point for China? I do think that it was a real uh, tipping point. China uh, saw that the United States dispatched two aircraft carriers to the area around uh, Taiwan. And uh, China had the ability to fire short range ballistic missiles, um, which they fired around Taiwan, but they certainly didn't have military capabilities to do much of anything else. They couldn't impose a blockade. Um, uh, they could just punish Taiwan with, uh, with missiles and they could not establish a beachhead 
Um, and I do think that really led to a review. Uh, if, if the PLA was asked at the time, give me some options, uh, what I could do against Taiwan, they couldn't do very much. And they were then, I think, tasked to develop other options. And that, of course, is what took place in the subsequent decades. Yeah. Um, the other uh, turning point or additional turning point is July 1999, when President Lee Dung Wei, uh, in effect, uh, changed the legal definition uh, of Taiwan's status. Uh, it's a complicated issue. I won't bore you. Um, but reportedly, uh, the generals went to um, Jiang Zemin and said, uh, we have to do something about this. We need to show those Taiwanese uh, what's what. And uh, Zhang, Zhang uh, responded to them by saying, well, tell me exactly what you can do. And there was a lot of humming and hoeing. Um, and Zhang said, well, you, you build up capabilities and then come back and we'll talk. Yeah. Yep. And the book describes that in great detail. And it's really, again, I know a lot about U.S.-Taiwan relations, but I learned a lot from this book. It's really just, it's just terrific. Let's talk about, you know, so pre uh, Biden was elected to overturn Trump's policies, but didn't really overturn the U.S. Taiwan U.S. policies towards Taiwan, and the book talks about that. Why? Well, I would I would uh, take a bit of issue with the premise of the question. Um, I um, I think that what we have seen over the course of the Biden administration, particularly in the last year is in some areas a reversion to um, something like the Obama policies. Um, I think um, a big change was in um, what we say uh, has to do with um, what we would do in a case of a war. Um, President Trump, I, I think, was um, pretty clear in private that he didn't like uh, the U.S. quasi-commitment to come to Taiwan's defense. Um, the official position of the Biden administration is that we oppose a unilateral change in the status quo by either side, which implies that we would come to Taiwan's defense, but doesn't commit us. Um, and what about, what about the president's state, uh, President Biden's statements on that? Issue. Well, uh, I think that's complicated. I think you'll find that uh, each of those statements is in a response to a uh, reporter's question while he was on the run. Um, President Biden is a nice guy. He likes to please the people he's talking to. Um, and um, he, um, I think, sometimes overstates what policy is. Um, he should never answer hypothetical questions. Um, the other area where there's been a change is um, economic relations. Uh, for decades, uh, USTR, USTR has been unwilling to uh, do anything creative in uh, U.S.-Taiwan economic relations, but we've started to do that under Biden, and that's a good thing. Um, so um, um, I think uh, in some areas there's continuity, and in some areas there's uh, a bit of change. I could just jump in quickly on President Biden's statements that we would defend Taiwan under um, all circumstances if the Chinese were to attack. I think there are a couple of other factors. I think that President Biden really does believe and he has said we have a commitment. We made a commitment to do that. And actually, um, I believe we did not. That's not what the Taiwan Relations Act says. Uh, so there is, I think, perhaps the president's own interpretation of our positions and our policies um, really don't match uh, what I think is the reality. And uh, then I think also President Biden ha is uh, often concerned about being criticized by uh, Republicans in Congress that he's not tough enough on China and not uh, strong enough in support of Taiwan. And I think that's often in the back of his mind when he makes these kinds of statements. So he wants to protect his flank. So um, he says uh, very tough things. Um, one final thing, uh, President Biden sometimes says um, what the Taiwanese do about independence is their business. 
well, it's not their business. Um, to say the two things together, though, that Taiwan can do what it wants on independence and we will defend them no matter what, uh, that creates a very, um, a very bad impression in China. And it gives encouragement to certain forces in Taiwan uh, who should not be encouraged. The Trump administration put special forces <clears throat> on Taiwan to train uh, the Taiwan military. President Carter committed to remove all military from Taiwan, all US military from Taiwan. Is that policy a violation of Carter's commitment? In my view, Steve, uh, first of all, we don't know uh, when various kinds of uh, training uh, started. There's There's been training of Taiwan's military forces for a very long time. Uh, some of it is associated with uh, the purchase of weapons such as F-16s. We've been training their pilots. Uh, but I'm not convinced uh, that the Trump administration's um, sending of uh, special forces was necessarily new, but I don't know. Uh, but I think there is a trend of more training of Taiwan's military that has continued uh, in the Biden administration. And it has involved the rotation of forces uh, to Taiwan to engage in training. But you use the term deployment, and that suggests permanent stationing. And it is my understanding that the United States does not have forces that are permanently stationed on Taiwan. And um, we should uh, acknowledge, yes, that um, in 1979, we broke the mutual defense treaty with, with Taiwan because that was part of the arrangement with the PRC of normalization. And we should be very careful uh, to not uh, give Beijing the impression that we are resurrecting that treaty because not everything the US does will cross China's red lines. We know they kick and scream about many of the things that the US does. But I believe that recognition uh, of Taiwan as an independent sovereign state, you know, giving uh, Taiwan diplomatic recognition or reviving that mutual defense treaty uh, are really what China's red lines are. Uh, so that's something that at least should be in the minds of decision makers as we discuss how to bolster Taiwan's capability to defend itself, which is included in the Taiwan Relations Act as an obligation of the United States, and of course includes um, selling defensive weapons. Yeah, you have this great quote, which I remember Wang Yi saying, which, uh, you know, if, if China wanted to, it could reduce uh, Taiwan's, the countries that have diplomatic relations with Taiwan to zero. Uh, Two questions, could they and why don't they? Well, I think at this particular juncture, um, uh, you know, Taiwan is now down to 13, um, what they call diplomatic allies. Uh, and uh, China, I think, continues to chip away uh, at, at many of them. Uh, it's hard to say whether China uh, believes that they should go to zero. Uh, they want to have the ability to take an ally to send a signal uh, to Taiwan and the people of Taiwan. I don't think it has quite the impact that maybe people in Beijing think it does because Taiwan is, is, is focused not only on preserving as many of its diplomatic allies as it can, but also expanding uh, cooperation with many countries around the world, the US being at the top of that list, uh, but you know, countries in Europe and Japan and Australia, et cetera. Uh, but um, I think that um, and the, the PRC understands that if they actually were to leave Taiwan with zero, that might um, cause Taiwan to say, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just time to declare independence and get it over with. The, the, the more that uh, China does not provide some assurance to Taiwan, um, I think the more dangerous the situation becomes and they have to leave Taiwan some space uh, so that if, if, chi if China does, uh, if, if Taiwan does not declare independence, it has to be confident that 
China will not attack and will give leave them some room to operate um, internationally. So I think it's dangerous to have um, a, a real excess emphasis on deterrence by force and threat and to not provide assurances. And I hope that China understands that. We will just briefly touch on a, a really a great part of the book, which is the seven scenarios going forward. Um, what do those scenarios, is there any common thread in the seven scenarios? We don't have time to talk about each of the scenarios. Briefly speaking, um, there are a couple of economic scenarios. Um, one is that Taiwan deepens economic dependence on China, and that has implications for the political relationship. Uh, two is that deglobalization and U.S.-China economic decoupling leads to Taiwan's isolation. Um, then there are some political military uh, scenarios. One is a negotiated political settlement between the Taiwan and the between Taiwan and the PRC. Um, uh, another is um, adapting or adjusting the status quo. Um, um, Next is uh, a conflict precipitated by Taiwan declaration of de jure independence. Um, uh, yet another is a PRC initiated military conflict um, in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, then a um, uh, final one is that uh, China initiates uh, limited military action against Taiwan to bolster its red lines. So that's the range. Some are in economic areas, some are military, some are violent, some are not. Yeah. And and I mean, they're worth, again, we don't have time to talk about it, but it's really, it's a very interesting analysis. We have time for one last question, uh, which is if you were advising the, Chi the, the Chinese government, um, would you advise them to stop using the word reunification and talk about a political solution? And then if they said to Taiwan, you can keep your government, you can keep your military, you can have kind of a European Union economic relationship with mainland China, um, you, Taiwan, could have representative offices uh, throughout the world. Um, would China do that? Would Taiwan agree? So I'll start, but I definitely would like Richard to weigh in on this as well. Um, my belief is that uh, that kind of an offer, as you describe, is not sufficient for Taiwan, uh, that they would want much more. But um, I would certainly not speak for the people uh, of Taiwan. Uh, China has never really provided a good offer. Um, and what matters is not the term reunification. What really matters is one country, two systems. Um, China didn't respect that arrangement in Hong Kong and that and the people of Taiwan never supported one country, two systems, but they certainly don't after uh, what happened in, in Hong Kong. But the people of Taiwan look at the governance system on mainland China. And I think ultimately that's not what they want to live under. They have freedoms. Um, they have their own values. Um, they have a very open media, uh, probably one of the most open in the world, and they want to keep their political system. And so uh, they, even if China gave lots of province, lots of promises, I think there would be a lot of skepticism that the PRC would actually keep them. But I do think that ultimately the PRC has to provide a better offer than they have provided so far. Yeah, what I said, of course, was Taiwan got to keep its own government, got to keep its own military. Richard. Um, well, um, I think that we need a lot more detail or the Taiwan people need a lot more detail uh, about how that government would actually function. If it's a fully democratic system, um, that's one thing. Um, but the Hong Kong model is one where Hong Kong at best had only a partial democracy. Um, my perception of Xi Jinping is he values control above all. And uh, he would not want to see a political system in Taiwan where a political party that he felt was, uh, in effect, a bunch of subversives, the DPP, could get come to power. 
Um, and so um, I think the people of Taiwan uh, would at a minimum want uh, to be guaranteed uh, that their democracy would not change. Yeah. In other words, what I was supposing in the question was the government remains unchanged. They already have the DPP in power, so they're not going to do worse than that. This conversation was intended to give the viewers a sense of what is in this book. It is, as I said at the beginning, U.S.-Taiwan relations. It is a must read for people interested in Taiwan. And I really hope our executive branch and congressional branch um read this because it just informs so coherently, so clearly. And I thank you both for your service. I thank you both for writing this book and being great supporters of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you, Steve.